Pastor Leslie reminds us every Sunday, and I get to do it today, the reason we are here is because Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. Let us worship him. Would you please turn your hymnals to hymn number 64 and sing with us, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to remember that you're here with us. May we pray to you in faith, sing your praise with gratitude, and listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Please remain standing for our affirmation of faith taken from the book of Romans, Romans chapter eight. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor 
angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. It's time now for our children's message. If our kids would come forward and those who are joining with us on television or online this morning, they're welcome to gather around screens and televisions. We want to have a special word for our kids, for our kids today. So this week is a really in, a special week in you guys' life. What happens this week? What happens this week? Did I hear somebody say school? Are y'all very excited about that? I hear some no's, I hear some yeses. One of the things that I got excited about when I was your age was whenever school started, I would get a, a new box filled with school supplies. I loved, I loved to get new school supplies. Well, I was, uh, um, gosh, I would always lose my school supplies. And so my mom, she would put my name on everything. She'd put my name on, on everything from a ruler to, uh, to pencils and scissors, even crayons. She would put my name on my crayons because I would, I would lose track of, uh, of, of, my, of all of my stuff. And, I wanted, and my mom wanted to make sure that everybody knew that these were, these were mine. And that's important. That's important for us to know what is ours. If they're very e things are easy to uh, things are easy to to lose. Well, we also need to know not just what is ours, but we need to know whose we are. Who do we belong to? Absolutely, we have moms and dads to help take care of us. But there's a, there's a passage of scripture I want to read to you, and it says from Second Corinthians chapter one, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. God, it's as if God has written his name on us so that we belong to God. We belong to God. Just like these school supplies belong to me and just like your backpacks belong to you and your school supplies belong to you, so we all belong to God. Here in just a moment, Miss Mary is going to hand out a little tag that we have for you to put on your backpacks. Uh, and it's just a simple tag that you, your mom or dad or someone will be able to write your name on the back uh, on this tag. And so it'll let everybody know whose, whose backpack it is and uh, whose bag it is and whose uh, all kinds of supplies. But also on the back side of it, there is a special prayer. And uh, this is a prayer to remind you that you belong to God. You belong to God. So here, just we're gonna we're gonna bow in prayer. I'm gonna pray this prayer over you all. Miss Mary has some tags for you to for you to take, uh, and and if we have other students as well, not just our elementary students, but if we have if we have other students that want to come forward, uh, we would love to pray over you as well and bless you as well. Let's bow in prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we pray that you would be with these students as they go to school this week. Bless their going and their, and their coming. Bless their learning and their playing. Protect their hearts from fear. Keep them safe. Give them good friends. Give them joy on, on this day and in the coming days. And oh Lord, thank you for loving them from head to toe. And Lord, we pray for your special blessings upon them. Help these students know, oh God, whether they are in elementary school, whether they are in middle school, whether they are in high school, whether they are in college, help them to know, oh God, that you are teaching them your ways. Help them to 
Help them to know that they are yours, that they belong to you. We pray for your blessings and protection upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Get one of those tags from Miss Mary. She has us. So today we know that we have not just students here today, but we also have lots of teachers here as well. Uh, not only folks who are regular participants of our church, but we have uh, teachers from uh, our community here. We have, especially, we have a number of teachers from San Jacinto Elementary, our partner agency and our partner school here in here in Amarillo. So we want to have a special prayer blessing upon our teachers. So if you are a teacher or you, you work in the school system, if you would stand, uh, first we want to recognize who. So if you would stand, we want to recognize, we want to recognize all of our teachers, others as well. You bet. And, and if, you'll, if you'll remain standing, we want to have a special prayer blessing over you. Uh, teaching in this uh, post-pandemic world is more difficult now than ever. I know uh, my wife is a teacher, my siblings are, my, my parents were both teachers, all of my siblings are either teachers or married to, married to teachers, and it's a, this is a difficult world to be a teacher because it's a difficult culture that is, that is, that is so, that is so divided, and you as teachers have an important and have an incredible part to play in the lives of students. And this is, I believe, a divine calling upon your life. So let's pray for our teachers. God, we give you thanks for these that have committed their lives to serving students and serving you and bringing your kind of love into the lives of students. These people who are standing, they are so gifted in reaching out to the least and the last and the lost. They are so gifted at, at reaching out to those students that feel like they're on the outside and bringing them into the fold. God, we pray for your blessings upon these teachers. We pray for your protection for them. We pray that you would protect their hearts. You pray that you would protect their, their bodies during the cold and flu season. And Lord, we pray that you would protect their spirits as well. Oh God, draw them closer to you. Help them to live out your kind of love, a self-sacrificing kind of love. God, you've called them to love students. You've called, them, you've called them to teach them. But most of all, you've called them to be your hands and feet and voice in this world. So bless them for that purpose. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God, our Father, you are so good. Your mercies are new every morning, and your steadfast love never ends. It never fails. You have loved us with an everlasting, never-ending love. And we know we don't deserve that love. But you love us anyway. You love us in spite of our failings, in spite of our faults, in spite of our sins, in spite of all of the things that make us less than you want us to be. And yet, Lord, you love us. You have loved us so much that you sent your own son to save us. And you showed us the full extent of your love on the cross. God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that, that you never leave us or forsake us, that you never forget us or ignore us, but Lord, you love us always. And because you are good, because your love is so great and so strong, and because we know that you can do anything, that you, are, you have all the power, all the glory, all the honor. And so because of this, we know we can bring our prayers to you. We lift up today those who are hurting, those who are in need of healing, those whose bodies ache, those whose minds are confused, those whose spirits are downcast and depressed. We lift up those who are grieving today, 
who are mourning for someone or something they have lost. We pray, Lord, for those who are confused, who are looking for direction. And we pray for those who are lost, those who are living in a land of deep darkness, who desperately need your light. God, now we lift to you the names of those we know who are in need of your grace and your mercy and your healing and your strength. Holy God, we lift these prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray not only for those who are hurting and struggling today, but we pray also for our brothers and sisters who are gathered around the world today to worship you. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters at Pleasant Valley Baptist, at Westview Christian, and at Borger First Methodist. Lord, we pray that you would bless these brothers and sisters, that you would meet with them just as you are meeting with us, that you would hear their prayers, that you would speak your word to them, and that you would send them out in mission. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise. In the good and holy and perfect name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in worship, it's time now for our morning offering. As our greeters come forward, I want to um, highlight one of our very special ministries here at Polk Street. With the beginning of the school year also begins our year of preparing and handing out snack packs. A number of years ago, um, there was a gentleman uh, driving around and, and he, on a, it was on a weekend and he, and he saw some kids in a in a dumpster near a school and he thought they were up to no good and uh, so he began to watch them and realized that they uh, they were intent on on finding something in the dumpster and so he began he, he started realizing that these were kids that actually they were digging in the dumpster uh, trying to find food on weekends students without very many means at home they are well fed during the week but during the weekends, then, they go home and they don't oftentimes have food. And so here at Polk Street, uh, we are proud that over the last almost 10 years or so, we have been very involved with Snack Pack, Snack Pack for Kids. And our partner school, and we have a, we have a great relationship with our partner school at San Jacinto Elementary. Many of those teachers are here today. Um, we, we, Polk Street, we feed 150 to 200 children per week per week, each and every week. Uh, we hand out those snack packs on Friday so that those uh, students will have those packs of, uh, of food to take home with them. Uh, coming up this Saturday at 9 a.m. here at the church, yeah, I, th I, think, I believe the details were in, uh, maybe even in the bulletin, we're gonna be packing up our snack packs for the rest of this month, and so we need your help. Um, and we pack up again for an entire month at a time, and so uh, multiple hundreds of children that we are packing up food for. Um, and so you have that opportunity to be involved. If you are not able to, to take that opportunity to help us pack up these snack packs, 
Well, it takes around $60,000 per year for us to feed those students at, at San Jacinto. We are proud that we've been doing that for years and years and years, and we are able to do that because of your generous donations. There are so many ways that you can give to Polk Street. You can designate those gifts to Snack Pack or another ministry of your favorite ministry, or you can simply um, write a check or go online and give of those, of those finances or mail in your, mail in your contributions. Uh, we will make sure, we, will do, we do everything that we can to make sure that everything that you give goes to mission and ministry here in our community and around the world. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we, give, we thank you for your incredible love for us in Jesus Christ. We have come to know you as Lord and Savior, and we want others to come to know you as Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, we pray for your blessings upon these gifts and tithes and offerings. Bless them and multiply them that your love and, and grace and salvation may be experienced all around the world. Lord, I pray for a special, a special blessing upon this ministry of Snack Pack for Kids. God, we believe that we are doing your work. God, bless those givers. Bless those volunteers. Bless those students that receive these gracious gifts. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.
please remain standing. Turn your hymnals with me to 156, I Love to Tell the Story.
standing, if you, please remain standing if you are able for the reading of our scripture. Our scripture comes out of the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Uh, it's found on page 200 of the New Testament of your pew Bibles there in front of you. Peyton is here to read our scripture for us this morning. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Jesus Christ. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them along to others. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word, and make it be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. And now, O oh God, hide me behind your cross that your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal recently uh, that was fascinating. There was an article about church attendance in America. Now, this is not, I don't regularly read the Wall Street Journal. Someone, uh, one of you sent it to me. Uh, but from what I can tell, I don't think the Wall Street Journal particularly uh, writes stories all that often about church attendance in America. But this was, a, this was a, an article about church attendance in America and how it has changed since COVID. One of the keys to healthy churches in the United States is the participation of people in their 40s and 50s. This is an, an important, this is an important age group. It's always been an important age group, as this is the age group that has children who are in elementary and high school, elementary school and, and high school, people in their 40s and 50s. Parents are the single most important factor in church participation of children and youth. Did you get that? I don't think that's surprising to anyone that parents are the single biggest factor in whether a child or a youth attends church. If parents do not participate in church, well, their children very, very, very seldom participate in church as well. Now, there are certainly exceptions to the rule. My, my mother is an exception to that rule. My grandparents, her parents, did not attend church at all, but when she was a teenager, she started attending church on her own, and she faithfully participated in the life of the church in spite of her parents not attending church. She is the exception. Almost always, when a, when a parent does not participate in church, the children do not participate in church as well. One of the most troubling trends highlighted by this article in the Wall Street Journal was that church attendance for people in their 40s and 50s declined between, 19, or between 2019 and 2020, or excuse me, 2022. Between 2019 and 2022, people in their 40s and 50s, their church attendance declined by 13%. Now think about that. Just in three years, obviously we know the reason. It was during the pandemic. Parents that had children and youth, they simply quit coming to church. What this, what this article highlights is that those people who are in their 40s and 50s are now attending worship at the same rate as those in their 20s and 30s. Put in other words, Gen Xers are attending church at the same level as millennials. And this is disturbing. It's disturbing because for generations, for well over 200 years, when people got into their late 30s through their 50s, they were in church. Because what happens is that when you're in your uh, mid-30s, you typically have, you have younger children of the age, and those children begin to ask questions about, about faith. Mom, Dad, where did I come from? Mom, Dad, where did you come from? Mom, Dad, who is God and where did God come from? And to answer those kinds of questions, we need the, church, we need the help of others. We need, we need the church to help us raise our children, especially in this culture. This culture that has very different values than what most of us were raised with. We need the church to walk alongside us. The most, Again, the most disturbing thing about this article is that now we have parents in their 40s and 50s, who are now no longer coming to church, 
and who are no longer bringing their children to church. I bring this up. I bring this up because as parents, we have the greatest opportunity to disciple another person more than anyone else. We have the greatest opportunity to disciple another person. We have an opportunity unlike any, anyone else. As we examined last week, we are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to be. But I want to take another step further today. A disciple of Jesus Christ is also a disciple maker. A disciple of Jesus Christ is also and must also be a disciple maker. We are called to be disciple makers. As faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we are called not just to be disciples, but we are called to be disciple makers. We're continuing this short series as we've been thinking, uh, as we are thinking about the mission of the church. And, and last week we saw that the mission of the church comes from the Great Commission. We are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ as a church. That's our primary purpose. Sometimes as churches we can get so broad in our programming and in our focus that we lose that we really lose focus on what we are really to be about. We are to be about making disciples of Jesus Christ. And everything that we do here at Polk Street should be about or should go toward the goal of making disciples of Jesus Christ. If we have things going on in the life of our church that do not go toward that purpose of making disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to quit them. We just need to let them, I mean, they may not be bad things, but sometimes, again, as churches, we get so broad that we, lose our, that we lose our focus. And so, as a church, we are committed to making disciples of Jesus Christ. And as individuals, we are called to being disciples of Jesus Christ, being more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Last week, we mentioned our, our Bible studies that are going on and starting up this week. Those are two incredible opportunities for you to, to take a next step in your following of Jesus Christ. We talked about Sunday school as well and small group ministries here at Polk Street. I said, if you do not have a small group or a Sunday school class here at Polk Street, you will always feel like you are on the outside looking in. You desperately, desperately need, you need a small group. I, I mentioned last week, I believe in the power of preaching, but if you are leaving, but if you are leaving your spiritual development up to a 25 minute sermon, once a week, I pray for your soul. It takes more, it takes more than that. And so we've got to, we've, we, we must commit ourselves to being faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. But again, I want to take it a step further today. Not only are we called to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to be faithful disciple makers as well. We are called to be faithful disciple makers as well. This passage from 2 Timothy is a, uh, this letter of 2 Timothy is Paul's second letter to Timothy. Paul was uh, one of the early church leaders. He had previously been a, 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 a Pharisee, a, a, a Jewish Pharisee, and he was, in fact, he was persecuting Christians. He was going about all over the ancient Near East, and he was persecuting Christians, the, these, these brand new, I mean, this was this was just in the first few years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as people began to follow Jesus and proclaim him as the Messiah, Paul was there persecuting them until he had a miraculous encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. And Paul was converted and he became a believer. And he began to, he began to take the gospel of Jesus Christ beyond Judaism, and he began, to, he began to take it all over the Mediterranean world, especially taking missionary journeys to the northern Mediterranean. And so, so because of that then, he became a leader in the early church, and one of his travel companions was a young man named Timothy. Timothy is mentioned in a number of Paul's letters as even a co-author of some of the letters that Paul has written in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy, in Paul's first letter to young pastor Timothy, Paul had been under house arrest. He had been arrested for his faith. He was serving under house arrest. He was at his home. He was able to, uh, to have visitors, and he was able to live somewhat of a normal life. By the time he wrote 2 Timothy, he was in a prison. 
He was in a dark and, and, and damp prison, and he knew that he had just months to live, very likely months to live, and in fact, he did. And so, he was writing a letter to Timothy, is the second letter to Timothy. Timothy was a, was a young pastor. Uh, some have, have, have proposed that Timothy may have been as young as 18 years old. Most scholars believe he was in his early 20s. Whatever the case, he was a young man that Paul had put in charge of a very important church in Ephesus. Ephesus was an important city. It was a very, very important church. And so, in the early church, and this would have been, this would have been the, within, the, within the first 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is a very, very early, early church. So, how did the early church go about its business? How did they, how did they do what they did? They didn't have a bureaucratic institution. They didn't, have a, they didn't have a structured hierarchy. They didn't have stained glass. They had no staff. They had no committees. How in the world did they ever get anything done, we might wonder? Well, they obeyed Jesus. That's what they did. They just simply obeyed Jesus. They didn't have much of the structure that we have. They didn't have the buildings that we'd had. They didn't have the professional staff that we had, but they were growing because they obeyed the command of Jesus. You remember those words last week? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Go and make disciples. They took his word seriously. And they took his word seriously, not only as a church, but they took his word seriously as individuals. They understood that they were called to be disciple makers, every single follower of Jesus Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't the pastor's job. It wasn't the staff's job. It wasn't the denomination's job. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the church's job because they didn't have any of those things. It was every single person's job to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Again, here in this passage, he clearly outlines exactly what he wants Timothy, what he wants Timothy to do. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful people. Entrust to other faithful men and women who will then be able to teach others also. Paul is telling Timothy that, you are, that, that Timothy is to be a disciple maker. Be a disciple maker who makes disciples. And so that's how the early church grew. That's how the, the, the gospel message grew. You know, friends, it's, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but times are a-changing. It used to be, not too many years ago, that you could have a, a, a church facility like this. Beautiful stained glass, a beautiful pipe organ, incredible, incredible singing, large programs, and you, all you had to do was just simply throw open the doors and the churches would be filled. No longer. That is no longer the case. That is no longer the case. We must not and we cannot rely upon the church to be the draw that brings people in. No, it is our responsibility, each and every one of us, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We are all called to be disciple makers. We are all called to be disciple makers. I grew up with the Canadian River. In Oklahoma, across the border, we called it the South Canadian River. There's an, in, in Oklahoma, there's a North Canadian River. Here in the Texas Panhandle, we know it as the Canadian River. It's the same river that's just right here north of Amarillo. It starts up in the Rocky Mountains in New Mexico, weaves its way through New Mexico, cuts its way through uh, the, the panhandle of Texas and across the high plains, even carving a path, deep cavernous path through the high plains and makes its way into Oklahoma and finally, uh, finally into the Arkansas River, which then empties into the, into the Mississippi. Well, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, um, we used to go down to the river uh, in uh, just, just north of where I grew up, a little town called Camargo. There's a bridge across the Canadian River there at Camargo, one of the few bridges in western Oklahoma across the Canadian River. I've read lots of stories and 
uh, lots of firsthand accounts of the old cowboys that would be moving all of those cattle across western Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle, and it was the Canadian River that caused their biggest trouble because that river is so wide and has such a sandy bottom, and you never knew what what kind of water was going, to be, was going to be flowing in the Canadian River. When my dad was a young boy, he told stories about when they found out that there had been a big rainstorm in Amarillo, Texas, they knew in about eight to 10 hours, they were gonna get a flood in Camargo, Oklahoma, because that's how long it took the water to get down. Well, now we don't see the Canadian River much at flood stages, and especially when I was a young boy. In the summertime, you could bet that you could go down to the Canadian River and a group of us, uh, including Justin, my friend, who's here today and a member of our church, we would go down and play beach volleyball down on the river because it was a sandy bottom. There was no water running in, in the Canadian River during the summertime. And so we would be down there playing beach volleyball and it was hot. <laughs> that sand was scorching hot, but there would be pools of water and they looked so tempting. Have you ever been to the Canadian River when it's not flowing and there's a, there's a pool of water? If you've ever done that, you know you just simply dip your toe in and it feels like bath water. <laughs> it is warm. It is, it is even more than warm. It is hot and it is stagnant and even may even be a little rancid with a, with a green film on top. You see, that's what happens to our own lives whenever we don't. It, it's like a river that's not flowing. That water becomes stagnant. And it's like a disciple who is not making disciples. When we, just, when we are just here to receive, and we're, when we're here to just simply uh, uh, take in Bible studies and take in sermons, but there's nothing ever, ever flowing out, we become stagnant in our own lives, in our own spiritual lives. If we are going to have living water in us, it means there is something flowing through us. It means we become disciples and then we are making disciples as well. So how do we do this? Where, where, where do we do this? Well, we make disciples. We must be people who make disciples where we live, work, learn, and play. Where we live, work, learn, and play. First, we must commit to making disciples where we live, and in our home is where it starts. Parents, I want to say what I said earlier. You have more of an opportunity to disciple someone than anyone else. Your children. You have more of an impact on your children's faith development than anyone else. You can say that teachers have an impact, and absolutely they do, but they don't have more of an impact that you have as a parent. And grandparents, I don't want to leave you off the hook. As grandparents, you have an incredible influence on your, on your grandchildren. I can't tell you the number of people that I know who say, you know, my parents didn't go to church, but I went to church with my grandmother, and she brought me to church. Every time I went and stayed with her, she brought me to church. I even have a family member who, whose, whose children do not go to church, and when her grandchildren come and stay with her, she reads them Bible stories. She's astounded, this family member, because she attends church. She's astounded that her grandchildren have never heard the stories of the Bible. They have never heard about Jesus Christ. And so every time they come to her house, she has a Bible, she has a Bible storybook. She reads Bible stories to her grandchildren because she understands the kind of impact that she can have as a grandmother. Friends, brothers and sisters, don't discount the impact that you can have on your family on your family, especially your children and your grandchildren. We are called to make disciples where we live, right there beginning in our home. We're called to make disciples where we live in our neighborhoods. I, 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 very likely, very likely, when, when you came to church this morning, you saw someone either out running in your neighborhood, probably a neighbor of yours, or mowing their yard, or putting golf clubs in their car. They were getting ready to go out and, and do something other than come to church. These are your neighbors. These are your neighbors. And, 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 and so then when their life begins to fall apart, 
whenever they may have a, a broken relationship in their family or a, a death in their family, you are living right next to them and you can disciple them. It's an incredible opportunity. We are called to make disciples where we, where we live and, and, and where we work, right there in our offices with our co-workers, with our, uh, the people that we do business with in our offices. You may think that you are the only Christian there in, in, in your office, and, and you may be. You absolutely may be, but I can promise you this. If you are, everyone is watching you. Everyone is watching you, and you can disciple them in the way that you live. Whenever you have a rude customer and, and after that customer leaves and, and the rest of the office is just bickering and, and they're complaining about that customer instead, you can, you can be a source of grace in the, lives, in the life of your office. You can disciple your coworkers. You can disciple your customers. You can disciple all kinds of people where you work, you, where you live, where you work, where you learn as well, where you learn students. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to deeply impact your fellow students. Whether you are in, uh, whether you're in middle school or high school or or college, you have a you have an incredible opportunity uh, in how you live your life. You don't have to. You, you, don't, you don't have to join in in bullying others. You don't have to join in in shaming others. No, living a Christian life. I promise you, you can disciple so many people doing that. And, and the teachers, don't think that I've, that I've left you out. You have both where you work and where you learn at the same place. It could be as simple as bringing your Bible, bringing your Bible and putting it on on your desk. I know a teacher who does that, and she has had so many students who have come up to her, and they've taken that, that, that book, and they've said, well, what's this? <laughs> what's well, a Bible? Well, I thought all Bibles were red. No, this is a black one. No, they come in all different colors. And she's had students literally open up the Bible. It's the very first time they have ever held a Bible in their hands, the very first time they've ever seen a Bible. Don't discount the kind of impact that we can have where we live and work and learn and play. Where we play, whether it's a, whether it's a waitress at a, at, a, at a restaurant or where we experience our entertainment at a movie theater or even, even our hobbies. If, if, you're, if you're paired up with someone on the golf course that you don't know, I promise you that is an incredible, that's an incredible ministry opportunity an incredible opportunity to make a disciple of Jesus Christ in the way that you live, in the, way, in, in the words that you say after an errant shot. I can promise you, you have an opportunity to make a disciple of Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity to point someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all called to be disciple makers. Not just to, not just to be faithful disciples, but to be disciple, disciple makers. I want you to notice one thing. I have not yet menis, uh, mentioned the word church. Did you notice that? We are called to make disciples where we live, work, learn, and play. Absolutely, we have an opportunity here at church, but it is way on down the list. Again, it used to be the case that you would simply open the doors of the church and people would stream in, and that's no longer the case. No, 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 not at all. If, if, if the next generation is going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's going to come from your lips. Did you hear me? I want to say that again. If the next generation is going to hear the gospel, the, it's going to come from your lips, not mine. It's going to come, it's going to occur outside the church, not inside the church. Where we live, where we work, where we learn, where we play, that's where we're called to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where we're called to be disciple makers. One last thing, and this is very practical. Coming up on August the 26th, there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a, 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 really a workshop on making disciples of Jesus Christ in Lubbock, Texas at Lake Ridge Methodist Church. I know the folks, and Katie, Pastor Katie knows the, uh, knows the leaders of this conference. We've both worked with them a number, a number of times. It's one of the most outstanding organizations called Spirit and Truth. It's one of the most outstanding organizations, Christian organizations I have ever been around. So more, note that on your calendar. If you are interested in any way, shape, or form about learning more what it means to live out your faith where you live, work, learn, and play, 
making disciples where you live, work, learn, and play. Put down on your calendar August the 26th. Uh, it be, it'll begin around 9 o'clock. It'll, it'll go through the afternoon. There's a link on the front page of our website. If you'd like to register for that, you're invited to do so. August the 26th is coming up. I can promise you, um, you will learn a lot at that, at that conference. The Lord Jesus Christ calls us, calls us to make disciples. It's not necessarily just, it, well, it's certainly not just the role of the church. And it's not just my job. That's not why I'm paid. It's not why Pastor Katie is paid or any of our staff is paid. It's not why we come together. We come together absolutely so that we can be faithful disciples. But it's your job. It's every one of our jobs as a follower of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples, to be disciple makers. Would you bow with me? Oh Lord, we thank you for your incredible grace. And just like Paul told Timothy to go and, and find someone to, to teach that can then in turn teach others, so you called us to do the same. Where we live and work and learn and play, you called us to live out our lives in such a way that when people see us, they see you. When people see how we live our lives, they see and experience the very hands and feet and voice of Jesus Christ. Oh God, empower us as a church to be disciple makers, to be disciples who make disciples, each one of us. Oh Lord, we pray that you would put, a, put someone on our heart right now, oh Lord, the name of someone in our hearts Maybe it's a child or grandchild. Maybe it's a coworker or a neighbor or someone, someone that, uh, that we come across in, in our community. Lord, put that name on our heart right now and help us to make a commitment today to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Just simply tell them, God bless you. Have a blessed day today. Or even if we might even be so bold to offer to, off, to, offer to pray with them when we see folks in our community struggling in life, oh Lord, help us to me, help us to be disciple makers. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The most important thing that we do throughout this week is not what we've just done. The most important thing that you do throughout this week is living as a faithful disciple that others might come to know Jesus Christ. Go. And be a disciple maker in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.